Hello everyone. My name is Kirti Devlekar. Shalom. Um, I'm the industry medical devices and healthcare industry manager at MathWorks. Um, I've been with MathWorks for the last nine years and my focus has been in the area of signal processing, advanced signal processing and um, showcasing how um, biomedical signals, for instance, and healthcare IoT applications can be merged together in our platform. So that's going to be my focus for today. Um, I will be welcome to this webinar on developing and deploying AI models for biomedical signals based healthcare applications using MATLAB. Um, so what I'm going to do today is uh, quickly cover a few topics. Uh, by the end of this workshop, uh, sorry, uh, seminar, you should get a good overview of uh, the end-to-end -end AI capabilities in MATLAB, uh, which can be used to develop healthcare IoT applications. So as you can see in the picture, we have uh, a board, uh, it's an NVIDIA Jetson AI board, uh, Jetson board where we've developed or deployed uh, the AI models and it, the kind of, uh, the board is kind of doing inference live, uh, although you can't see that per part, but that's the main idea. So I'm gonna be using three main examples today, right? And the uh, idea is to show you these, how these different workflows can be used and supported by not only just for developing AI models, but also for deploying uh, AI models in MATLAB. So the three examples are, the first one, uh, I'm going to be showing you a quick example on how you can do some signal classification using machine learning. So we will use some EMG signals for that purpose. Then we will move on to the next example, which is ECG classification um, using convolutional neural networks. And I'll talk a little bit about how we can uh, leverage convolutional neural networks to do some classification. And then I'm also going to show you how with the same signals, we can use do classification with LSTMs. Okay. So that's the main idea for today. So I don't, uh, so I'm going to be covering uh, all these examples pretty quickly. So one thing I do want to mention is uh, you I am going to be sending you all the slides and the content that I'm using in the webinar. So that way you don't have to take any notes or anything. So just sit back and relax as I go through these topics. Okay. And towards the end of the webinar, I can uh, pause for a little bit, uh, hang on, hang, um, and then if you have any questions, please let me know and I can take those. So please feel free to send your questions through the chat. I'll keep monitoring it uh, and then uh, and then we can go from there, okay? So the agenda for today is as, as follows. So we'll start with the terminology review so that we are all on the same page, right? Because there is a lot of terminology about AI, machine learning, deep learning. So we will just cover that pretty quickly. And most of this webinar is going to be technical, which means I'm going to be switching from PowerPoint to MATLAB, where I'm going to be showing all these things to you in action, okay? And the idea is um, I'll start with the machine learning workflow, where I'll show you some examples of how you could use some of our tech capabilities we have to develop machine learning models. And then I'll cover the two architectures that are uh, that I mentioned for deep learning. The first one is I will look at take, take a look at ECG classification using transfer learning approach. The second one is I will look at, I will show you how you can do ECG classification using invariant scattering convolutional neural networks and LSTMs. So throughout the presentation, I will, uh, you know, uh, focus a little more on why we are using a particular approach. And then if you have, again, questions, feel free to uh, reach out to me in the panel, okay? The next steps is uh, I will talk a little bit about deployment options that we have and then followed by some Q&A, okay? So that's the agenda for today. So without any further delay, let me just jump into um, the terminology review part, okay? So, the main idea is I'll be using these terms artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning interchangeably, right? So I thought maybe we just define what these terms mean. So at a very high level, when we say artificial intelligence, it's like the bigger umbrella that kind of encompasses everything um, in this, you know, mega trend that's currently going on, right? So the idea here is, you know, you're basically thinking of a, uh, the ability of a machine or robot or a computer to perform these tasks commonly associated with, you know, intelligent beings like human beings. So that's the main idea of uh, artificial intelligence. And it kind of overcompass encompasses every little topic like machine and deep learning. So machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence where we talk about uh, the practice of learning these tasks from data without re relying on a predetermined equation or model. Right, so there is some element of uh, 
when it comes to how to do this it's it's there's an element of some there's an art there is a science and there are some good tools that you could probably use to get to get through that uh, the process now deep learning is a more recent thing and it's basically you can think of this as a subset or a type of a machine learning technique where the model learns to perform tasks directly from some data like images text or sound right so now that you have the background i think i'll probably focus i'll talk about a little bit about what does fda here in the us uh, think about ai algorithms in medical devices so at a very high level fda is really bullish on uh, how artificial intelligence can you know really transform this industry and potentially unlock all the insights that are present in this uh, um, you know uh, in all the data that is generated during healthcare right, uh, during healthcare delivery so that's one key area where uh, uh, FDA is really interested and bullish about and very recently it's, this is just like a couple of months back FDA approved the first cardiac ultrasound software that uses artificial intelligence to guide the user so this is uh, a phenomenal breakthrough because now there is a device that can basically be I mean, where AI is predominantly used but in, in certain contexts like for guiding the user or uh, you know for certain applications so and the main idea behind this is FDA believes that this artificial intelligence or machine learning based software as a medical device can really help patient outcomes so that's where all the interest and excitement is currently going on in the medical industry where you know you basically have this piece of software that is doing all the job right and today in this webinar i'm going to be showing you um, the three approaches that could be used for you know quickly uh, developing these uh, uh, ai or machine machine learning based softwares okay so what is the overall how does the overall workflow look like in healthcare iot applications right so typically when you look at uh, you know developing any machine learning model most of the people focus on you know the model creation part and this is where you know they probably think this is the biggest aspect um, where you know you'd have to spend a lot of time in model creation machine learning or parameter optimization right so it turns out this is something that pretty much everybody uh, you know thinks this is the main area and this is the main thing where they can they need to spend a lot of time on but if you look at the overall workflow it turns out that this aspect of model creation is only like takes like 20 percent of their time most of their time is spent on you know basically developing the pipelines that are required to get your data from some database or files or some sensors into a system or into an area where you can actually reliably start working on the data right and once you get the data then the next step is it typically in you know if you look at healthcare iot kind of data uh, what people uh, found is you know the data is usually corrupted because these sensors are typically you know are not like high fidelity sensors you know even, even if you take um, unless you are looking at invasive sensors right so there's a lot of noise and other artifacts that kind of corrupt these signals so in some sense you have to work with messy data clean that up again that also takes a lot of time and uh, you know sometimes you also have to look for data reduction or transformation right because not all the data is useful so and finally you look at feature extraction and you kind of go from there right so this is where pretty much most of the people we talked to have said they've spent like 80 percent of their time the ones that have built successful ai applications and then it doesn't end there, right? So once you've developed these models, then the next part is to then share it with your colleagues or friends or customers or you know whoever that's interested downstream, which means you probably have to ship it as a desktop app or maybe you would have to take this algorithm and integrate it into some kind of a, a web application like an enterprise application. Or in this case, you could probably look at an embedded hardware device like uh, uh, that could be portable and the example that I showed you basically fits into this category right so the good thing is matlab kind of supports you regardless of what data you use the whole workflow and my job today is to introduce you to a few tools in these um, along these workflows to just to give you an idea as to what what are the kind of things you have so that you can start exploring um, uh, the new capabilities we have in matlab right okay so with that let's get let's straight away jump into this example uh, which is uh, emg classification using machine learning 
So the idea here is I have some sensor data, uh, eight channel sensor data that has been hooked up to an arm of a person and um, the sensors actually uh, are recording electromyography data, which is basically the muscle contractions. Whenever you contract a muscle, there's a small electrical signal that is generated. And the main hypothesis is, can we take all these signals and then identify what kind of activity or uh, uh, the person was doing? So you can think of it as, wrist hand movements and based on you know how you are uh, uh, clenching your wrist maybe there is some kind of an action that you want to convey so that's the main idea we are trying to do right so uh, uh, so how do we go about doing that so the first thing is uh, we want to look at different features that could come up from these signals and test various classifiers so we will go through this approach and i'll show you how you could uh, take this workflow and repeat it throughout using all the signal processing capabilities that are available in matlab and the main application for this is in prosthetics development where if you are developing a device i mean the customer that we worked with they were developing a prosthetic device and uh, some of these uh, we've helped them in coming up with the models uh, in matlab in terms of you know figuring out what the actions were okay so that's the main objective of this example now i'll jump into the main aspects of this example in matlab okay so just to give you a head quick overview of this right so this example is going to involve feature extraction meaning we'll extract manual features from the signals um, so the good thing is you know in matlab we have plenty of techniques that are available uh, for you to leverage in terms of extracting all the features so we have frequency domain features for example these are all the uh, uh, bandwidth measurement, spectral statistics, all the way to time domain uh, features like maybe peaks or patterns or change points or signal envelopes, right? So, so on and so forth. So I'm gonna use, be using a couple of examples. And with that, now let me jump into MATLAB to actually start uh, this example. Okay, so let me, EMG code generation. So this is my signal processing folder. So there we go. Okay, so here is my data, right? So let me, for, my data is all stored in some CSV files like training data. So I have a training data folder here. You can take a look at this. Um, if I look at my training data, I have some CSV files that are corresponding to each particular action, right? So now my goal is to take this data, load it into MATLAB. Now, how do I load it into MATLAB? It turns out the good there is a capability in MATLAB called data store, wherein you just call the functionality called data store, provide the location where your files reside. And what the data store actually does is basically it figures out uh, an efficient way to read all your data, right? At least, and then uh, store it in the memory. Now, the good thing is that way you don't have to spend time, you know, in managing your memory or figuring out how to best to load the data without having your machine to crash, right? So here I have the data store. I'm basically saying these are my formats and then my sensors, number of sensors, which is eight. And then when I call preview data store, uh, preview my or data store the good thing is it you can see all the sensor values here as a preview now if you want to read all this data all you have to do is just call read all method on the data store and boom you have all your data stored in this variable now the good thing is matlab actually figures out a good uh, the most efficient way to read this data in without you having to write code to explicitly do some data management or memory management. And even if these files are big, like for example, if you have uh, uh, you know large gigabytes or terabytes of data, then you can use an, uh, uh, the MATLAB construct called tall, tall array, which we can basically, you know, you can scale it up on your clusters and uh, help read that data without really having to write a lot of code. Right. So now that we have the data, the next thing is we'll look at the signals or we'll visualize the signals colored by action, right? So I have some signal metadata here, like sampling frequency and everything. And then once I have this, next, if I look at my data, right? So let me zoom this in so you can probably see this a little better, right? So I've just plotted some data here um, and I've basically colored the data based on the action, meaning whatever wrist action the person was doing. So if you look at this, so what I have is, you know, um, I have some patterns of chuck grip where, you know, you're basically, you know, clenching your wrists and some pinching here. And then, you know, you as you can see, the main idea here is 
when you color code this signal based on of the action, you can immediately see there are some actions that stand out, but there are some actions that are probably look very similar to each other, right? So this is where now we'll take a divide and conquer approach to start figuring out, okay, what features or how do we segment or separate these signals out? Okay, so in terms of figuring out what the differentiating features are between these actions, right? The first, we'll start with a simple technique called box plot. And what I'll do is I'll just look at, you know, basically I plot the um, statistical measurements of these small chunks of consecutive data. And regardless of how they're distributed in time, we'll take some statistics like min, max, and standard deviations. And then we can just quickly plot this. Um, uh, by hand position. So if I look at the sensor, um, oops, yeah. So if I look at the sensor uh, distributions, right, by hand position, you'll again see, you know, some of them have, you know, some, the, like for example, the width of the box is lower and, you know, sometimes you find the width of the box is higher. So this is, seems like some kind of features or differentiating features that you could use. So this is one approach, right? Now, the problem is if you're thinking, yeah, I can st I'll start using these statistical features as we go along, turns out there's only so much you can get with statistical features, right? So that's where you probably have to look into the signal processing realm to see if you can get some more feature. So one idea is, especially for signals that are statistically similar, um, it's gonna be hard to identify what features differentiate these signals. And you'll find this all the time, right? Even within signal processing, you'll notice that even you by using some simple signal processing techniques, you will not be able to differentiate your signals because they're probably having the same spectral properties, right? So then we'll go into the advanced signal processing a uh, little more in detail. But the idea is, let's use some basic signal processing to start off with. So a few things that I'm doing are I'm basically removing the DC offset in the signal. So I'm detrending my data and then I will do some full wave rectification. So this is one of the common steps that happens in EMG signals, right? So the main point I'm trying to highlight here is if you notice these functions are pretty slick, just one function. And then, you know, you just provide the most, the, the least amount of inputs uh, in addition to your signal itself, uh, then you basically get an output pretty quickly. So I think you can probably see how this is, this is what MATLAB really facilitates you to do, right? Where you don't have to worry about writing tons and tons of code uh, and just using some simple functions to visualize quickly and analyze your signals, right? So, so this is one approach right now. Do, how do we go about, you know, kind of scaling up this approach? Now, there are techniques that are available here. Now I'm going to be showing you that. So one aspect you could use is the signal analyzer app in MATLAB. And what this does is it basically, uh, so you can now, let me load up those signal sets, right? So, so I can load a few signals, like for example, I can load up the key grip and I can now use the three panels here, right? So there's maybe this is a second one, there's no movement. And then I can probably pick up I can probably pick up another one. So hang on a second. I'll probably zoom out. Yep, now you can see I'll pick up, you have the key grip, I have no move, and I will pick another one, whatever. Let's see, I will pick this one, supination, right? So now you'll see that you have different signals here and the quick, the good thing that the app does is it kind of helps you facilitate some quick analysis. Like you can analyze, essentially what this helps you do is analyze signals in time frequency and time frequency domains without you having to write code. So let me see, there's a question here. Um, how much data can be loaded using this method? I'm assuming you're referring to the data store. So the data store actually handles, uh, you know, files which are pretty small from kilobytes to all the way to files that are like gigabytes or uh, even terabytes. So the idea is you want to be using data store in conjunction with another um, variable type called tall. So tall data store. So uh, you just take the data store, convert it into tall. And what that does is it helps you scale your reading process across multiple clusters or uh, different um, working environments in the cloud. So, so the answer is yes, you should be able to theoretically load, the theoretically load as much data as you have, but if you have some specific questions or if you've run into issues, just reach out to us and we can help you um, uh, in terms of showing you how to do that, okay? All right, so now that we have, coming back to this, right, we have these different signals. Now as a 
machine learning engineer, I'm probably thinking, how do I load these signals up or how do I uh, look at these different patterns of the signals, right? So turns out you can use this app called the Signal Analyzer app that helps you visualize signals in time. Now, if you want to look at the frequency spectrum, all you have to do is just click on the spectrum and then you basically are looking at how the power is distributed across different frequencies. Now, I haven't specified the sampling frequency, which I can always do, but once I specify the sampling frequency, you'll see the frequency show up here, right? And immediately you'll notice there's some pattern here, right? So for example, uh, the key grip, you know, the the overall shape seems to be looking, you know, uh, very different from compared to the no move, where there is no movement, you start seeing these peaks again. again. How the main point is we are trying to use these signal processing techniques to see, okay, you know, if there is some kind of uh, uh, a differentiating feature that shows up, right? So this is one idea. Then you could do something, you can do something like you can use some time frequency analysis. Um, okay, so let me look at this question. So the question is when you measure EMG, there is a significant significance to the exact location of the muscles. How can you remove the different frequencies caused by the placement location of the sensor. So, Yaron, this is a very good question. So, yes, there is certainly some kind of significance to where the positions is placed, right? But again, in some sense, at this point, I'm not really looking at removing those differences. I'm kind of just focusing on, um, you know, I'm. We assumed, or we this was a controlled experiment. We've kind of put the, we've looked at the, all the locations, or we've kind of focused on where we want to take the signal in, and that's why we didn't really look at okay, uh, what are the different artifacts that could be caused by the placement location of the sensor. So, all right, thank you, Iram. So now you we look at coming back to this, right? So you have different techniques like for example you have time frequency techniques here like this is the very simplest form of time frequency technique uh, which is called the spectrogram or short time Fourier transform and again the main idea is if you notice it's just pretty simple point and click no questions asked you will get your analysis um, yeah I think I I've answered that question more uh, about how much data can be loaded just like a couple of minutes back no worries. All right, so then, so with these techniques, I just want to introduce you to this app, but then now, you know, if you want to, you know, extract some of these features, you could, you know, quickly use uh, either once you've figured out what technique works from your using the app, and then you can quickly code it up in MATLAB. So here, what I'm using is I'm just using some kind of a low pass filter to remove some filtering uh, again it's pretty simple if you if you notice here it's uh, it's basically a pretty simple filter that i'm applying to my data then the next step is if i want to remove the rms envelope again that's another technique that i can use to uh, remove the linear envelope for the signal itself so i have for example here i have the rectified signal the low pass filtered signal the envelope signal right so they're all plotted uh, one over on top of each other, right? So that's one set of features that I could use, right? And in a similar pattern, there are other features that I can start using like the peak power, total power. For example, if I look at the periodogram of how these two signals um, can be separated, one thing, one way of looking at it is maybe look at the area under the curve and that could tell you exactly how much, uh, uh, how these signals could be different, right? So. So this is in, the, in such fashion, so for example, if you look at the area under the curve, I mean, again, this, these are not like uh, great calculations, but something to start off with. And uh, once you kind of do these analysis, pretty quickly, the next step is to kind of train a classifier, right? So in this case, I'm actually generating all the features through this uh, function. I think I probably have to use, I think just I need to add that into the, Path. So now we should be able to see this. So if I go to this, so here it, it's going to be here. So if I just click on generate features, you'll see, I think it's here. So I'm using the standard deviation, for example, the periodogram. I showed you the example of how I'm going to use the area under the curve and then detrain the signal itself, remove the linear envelope or find the linear envelope of the signal. And then I concatenate these, all these things as a feature for all my signals. And then I kind of uh, take it to the next step, right? So then, then the now, now that I have all my data here, the next step is to kind of load up different uh, classification models. And 
uh, or at least train different classification models. So how do we go about doing that? So, so the best way to do that is through this app called Classification Learner. Again, you can go to MATLAB, click on Classification Learner. You will find it somewhere here. Yep here and what this does is it helps you now evaluate various different or different classification models that are available in MATLAB to for the, all the features that you've extracted right so I have I think the training data which is here so so I have my raw sensor data and then the final column is the action column so and then I'll just start off with some kind of cross validation or hold validation I just start my session and then now the good thing is now if I want to train all my you know, models, I can just select maybe some models that are quick and easy to train. So these are all the features that I've extracted across all the signals. So if you notice, I can quickly train some models just as a starting point, just to see how the model kind of performs, right? So, so the basic models probably are not gonna give you a good accuracy here. And on the right, I can show you, see, we can see all the features. This is the raw data out one and two, and then for these different classes, right? So. Um, I think I loaded up the wrong data set here because I'm just loading up my entire data. I shouldn't probably load up my entire data. I should rather use just the features. So let me open it up again. So if I go back to my apps, I go to classification learner. I think what's the variable name here? Let me just quickly look at the variable name. I have my training data and my test data, I believe. Yeah, train data SP is my are my features. So I'll just load my train data SP features, which is should be here. Um, yeah, it's here. Train data SP is my here. I have all my variables here as I've extracted, and finally my action. So if I just start, so I think that was a good exercise. If I just load up basic the entire signal itself, obviously my machine learning models are not going to do a good job. So I'm going to now train some simple models. Now you see tree model has actually given me like 85% accuracy, right? And then I'll line up some different machine learning models. And again, you know, depending on uh, the, what kind of machine learning model um, is gonna work, we'll, we'll try out all the different varieties. And the good thing is if you have parallel uh, multi-core processors on your machine, the, this app actually takes advantage of that and it can help you speed up all your training process for a, for, a, for all your data sets, right? So this is one, one approach of, uh, uh, you know, basically building up your machine learning models. So seems like this is the highest so far quadratic discriminant, which is good. But if there are others like SVMs or, uh, yeah, I think SVM was probably not that good. So, but anyway, so now you get the idea here, right? So once you train your models, the next step is if you like a particular model, let's say you like this model, take the naive Bayes model, for example, export the model to MATLAB, right? So then you have basically have a variable. Uh, what it does is basically starts doing the prediction or you can export the compact model or you can generate the function itself, right? So that's the main idea in terms of, you know, looking at this. So then what I've done is I've basically taken up that model and then now I have taken, I've tried to see how my model performs with respect to uh, uh, the test data set. And it looks like I'm getting an accuracy of roughly 78%, which is not that bad. And then I can look at, you know, where my model is doing a good job versus a bad job and kind of go from there, right? So this is one, this concludes the first example. Now I'm going to go to the uh, screen, uh, the slides, and then talk about the second example here. Right, so we, so far we've seen how you can do uh, machine learning using this uh, nice app like Classification Learner and also the, all the signal processing capabilities. The next step here is to use deep learning on signals. And now I'm going to talk about two specific workflows which we can use, right? The first workflow is, um, you know, imagine a situation where you don't really have a lot of time, right? And you want to quickly leverage, um, reuse some of the models that are already available out there, like convolutional neural networks and apply it for your problem. So think of this as, let's say you quickly have, uh, you know, uh, the best part about this example or this workflow is you can automate the whole process 
right? You can start the process of model building uh, before you go, go, before you leave work and go home, right? And then by the time the next day morning, you come back and your model is ready, which can actually do a good job of classifying signals into different categories. So the approach that I'm going to be using is I'm going to be taking some ECG signals, right? And I'm going to be using the transfer learning technique, which involves using convolutional neural networks uh, to classify the signals into three different distinct categories. So one step that is required to for us to use the convolutional neural networks is to convert our signals to time frequency representations. And again, as the goal is to do this quickly without really worrying about a lot of different things, I'm going to be showing you a nice workflow that takes this entire workflow and you can actually uh, quickly develop a model even if you don't have a lot of time, right? So one of the reasons now, you, one may ask, why do I need a time frequency map, right? So if you think about it, a time frequency map is a visual representation of all the information that is con contained within a signal because your signal could contain um, some frequency components. Um, and the other important part is even there are, there are signals that actually contain two sig different sig signals that are different could also contain a very similar power spectrum, right? So the idea is a time frequency map can help you see how these power spectrum or spectral features evolve as a function of time. So in some sense that gives you a good pattern or shares, saves it as a good pattern, right? And in some sense, these things can be saved as images. And many deep networks that are built can take these network images as an input. And the idea of deep networks is they take this input representation, extract features from this, and then they are able to use that for classification, right? So we've seen that many times in, uh, in across different examples. So with signals, what we are doing is we are saying, hey, we just take the signal and convert it into a time frequency map and then go through this process. Now, one question you can ask is, hey, why can't I, why do I need to use a time frequency map? Why can't, just, why can't I just use my signal? So the answer to that question is yes, you can use your signal, you plotting in time domain, but if you really think about it, you know, let's say if your signal has, uh, if your signal is collected from different sensors or different hardware equipment, there could be some kind of DC offset or there could be the peak to peak amplification could be different. And none of those things actually correspond to the final class that you are really looking to look at, right? For example, normal signal versus arrhythmia, it doesn't matter what the peak to peak amplification is, right? In some sense, what you're really looking for is the presence or absence of some morphological features within the signal. And that is where time frequency maps can help you, you know, you know, generate some kind of representation. Now, those representations can manifest as patterns or features that could be extracted by these deep networks. And that's why we are using the time frequency map technique because those patterns will not be clear in the time domain signal, right? That's the main idea here. So there are many techniques of you know, converting time signal to time frequency representation. And I'm going to be using one specific technique called the continuous wavelet transform to generate sharp time frequency maps. And the reason why I am using this is because it's just one line of code for generating time, uh, time frequency visualization in MATLAB. If you think of this, this is, these are my ECG signals, right? And since I'm, I don't have to specify any input parameters compared to if I look at spectrogram or scale, the spectrogram or short time Fourier transform, you know, I can get a very good time frequency view. And in some sense, if you think about it, you'll get the same time frequency view regardless of what, uh, parameters you choose. And the other beautiful aspect of this technique is it can help localize sharp transients or sharp changes and slowly varying oscillations simultaneously. That is something that your short time Fourier transform doesn't help you do that. So I do have you know other libraries or rich time frequency transforms, but I'm not going to be talking about those because um, the main idea here is preserving the information that is contained within the signal. That's the most important thing, right? So now that you know, or at least have got some idea of the time frequency maps, um, how about the deep learning networks, right? What can you do with that? So we talked about transfer learning, but in, in reality, there are three different ways in which you can start with uh, deep learning networks in MATLAB. The first way is you can interactively design your deep network. So if you're a pro person, you know what exactly, what you're doing exactly, then you can create your own deep network. If you are looking at, you know, mainly like a soft, uh, if, you, if you're interested in doing some coding, we have these, uh, you can use the other second option, or you can use the third option, which is a customizing pre-trained networks where these networks have been already made available and we've just, uh, or have been already architected and trained and we are just using that, train, customizing it so that it can learn for our applications. So 
so here's one example of uh, creating your own deep network, right? So you can pull, drag and drop those layers pretty quickly, create your own deep network. Maybe you are looking at a paper or you're looking at some kind of a publication. So you can use this model to quickly create your own deep network. So this is one example, or you can import your deep networks as well that you saved and you can start inspecting those different layers. So, so you have the image input layer, you have the convolution layer, ReLU layer, max pooling layer, so on and so forth. So you have all the basic building blocks here and you can take these building blocks and quickly create your network. And once you create the network, you can look at analyzing your network, the connections, the nodes at different points, and then looking at these activations and so on and so forth, right? So once you're done, you can also generate or you, go, you can create this, uh, export this uh, network to uh, the command prompt, or you can generate a script which can programmatically help you to, uh, let's say if you are doing some experiments and you want to keep changing some parameters here uh, programmatically, MATLAB also spits out this uh, code that can help you, uh, you know, use this uh, deep networks. So that's the one idea. Then the next idea is to write code to design deep networks. Again, you can write your own code like this and create your own networks. That's also obviously a case. The third thing is you have all these pre-trained networks that you can use as a starting point. And for today's example, I'm going to be using one pre-trained network, uh, 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 one of the pre-trained networks here to actually, okay, so I think something is going on. Oops, my computer froze. I'll just give you one second. No problem. I just want to remind everyone that uh, if you have questions, you are more than welcome to ask in the chat, in the question, in the Q&A chat. Oh, oops. This is weird. Yeah, I think my MATLAB crashed or my machine froze. So let me close this and try to open it again. Guys, he is excited because it's uh, performing to Israel. So yeah, now it's back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. Good. So sorry for the hiccup. So let me go back to my script here. Sometimes the IT teams decide to update our machines and. I'm going to close this classification learner app so we can get some space back. Yep, now we have some good space. Okay, so while this is loading up, there's a question. Is there a pre-trained model for semantic segmentation available in MATLAB? Uh, yes, Yoni, so you can take some of these pre-trained networks and you can customize it to basically generate or create a semantic segmentation of your image. And we have some examples that we can um, obviously share with you if you're interested. All right, so I'm going to go back to my code. So this is my transfer learning example. So I'm going to load this up. So here's my signals, right? So I'm not going to maybe jump a little more quickly here. So I have 162 signals here. Each signal is 65,000 samples long. And then I have three classes of these signals, right? So I'm not going to cover this uh, technique. I mean, I think this is probably self-explanatory. So the idea is if you look at the short time Fourier transform approach, I'm just showing you, you know, how it kind of is different. So I have my signal and I have my short time Fourier transform. If you look at this, I mean, if you look at my signal, I have all my short variations within my signal here on the left, which means these are like relatively higher frequencies and that I'm ex I'm, I expect these to be separated in time. But if you look at my signal here, the time frequency representation, I don't see that separation here. So what it means is sometimes, you know, this could be, you, there could be a situation where you have two signals, even if um, they seem different, you may not see the difference show up in the time frequency representation if you're using the spectrogram technique, right? Now, if I look at uh, um, the scalogram technique, for example, right? So now let me just open this up, right? So so this is one example. Let me show you this real quick, like 
if I compare it side by side, maybe first I'll show you this, uh, these two signals here. So I have, so this is my class one and this is my class two, right? So if you notice my signals are kind of little different uh, in time, but my, I can't tell the difference if I just look at the time frequency representations, they look very similar. So then that's not a desirable thing, right? So that's why I look at these advanced time frequency techniques. And when I plot my time frequency maps here, Right, so here, for example, if I look at my time frequency map for class one and class two, one thing you'll notice is, you know, the class one signal has these patterns kind of show up at regular intervals and then, you know, the spacing seems to be perfect, right? But if you look at the class two, you look at these patterns that kind of, you know, the spacing kind of changes, um, the varies a lot. So this could be a pattern. And if you have a nice deep network, it can extract all these patterns. And that's exactly what we're doing here, right? So what we're doing now is take all the signals, generate the time frequency representations. And if you notice, it's pretty simple, right? Just one line of code uh, to generate all the time frequency representations. All you need is just the signal length. And I have a, a function here that actually I've commented out. What it, what it does is it basically generates time frequency representations going through all the signals. So I have one video that I can play here if you, if you just wanna see how this kind of goes. So it goes, loads up every signal that I have, right? Generates a time frequency representation and saves it as an image. Kind of go from there, right? Now, I, once I have all the images stored, here, so basically I have all my data for you know, all the images for all these different classes. The next step is I use a data store and I basically take a data store here. This is now a very special data store called image data store. Specify the root or the starting point and then what this does is it basically creates a data store with all the files in place. I can now perform some operations on this data stores. Like for example, I can split this data store into two segments, two data stores, training images data store and test images data store with just one line of code. And this kind of does it automatically, right? And now once I have done this, my next step is to now take uh, the AlexNet network, right? So here in this case, I'm training this pre-trained network. Uh, all I'm doing is if you look at AlexNet, for example, you can download the support package from the add-ons menu. So if you go to home add-ons menu here, you'll find all the support packages listed here. So you can just take these support packages. And the main idea is if you look at AlexNet, somebody created this network with, you know, so that it can di differentiate between classes of thousand uh, objects meaning it can differentiate between thousand objects. But in our case, since I only have three signals, I'm just changing the last layer to instead of thousand to just three. That's the lowest, I mean, that's the basic amount of changes I'm making so that I can customize this network for my purposes. And once I do this, then my next step is I just train my network, right? To train my network, I take some initial values like learning rate is so much, epochs is so much, many batch size so much, and kind of, you know, uh, start training my algorithm, right? So I've already trained this in some sense, so I can, I can show this to you, or we can, what we can do is we can actually just make this train right now as we are talking, right? So this will probably take a few seconds or probably it's looking at, it doesn't have the training data. It's because I haven't created the training data here. I just need to ex execute this. So I have all my training data and then I have my network. I make all my changes to my network and then I can just execute this a little bit, right? And then I just call up my training network function and that will start the training process, right? So this is, you know, basically I'm just starting my training process here. So, you know, it'll start with some values and then eventually you'll notice your loss kind of starts going towards zero and then your network starts training. It means it learns all the features from your input time frequency representations. And eventually what this will result in is, you know, you'll get the nice trained model out, you know, at the end of this model, your MyNet is gonna be your trained model. So I'm gonna just load this real quick within MATLAB. And I think I should just stop this training process so that my MATLAB can become more responsive. Yeah, so then I'll just load this file that I've already trained in MATLAB. I mean, I've already trained and saved it. And then I'm going to be evaluating it on the test data set. And you'll notice that, you know, 
my model has done a good job of classifying all my data. And again, this is just one example that I've show, wanted to show you how you can use these time frequency representations to quickly train up deep models in your in your uh, in MATLAB, especially pertaining to signals, right? So, so that kind of brings me to an end to this particular workflow. Then the next particular example that I'm going to talk about, I think it's something you'll probably like is, now what if you want to, don't want to use a convolutional neural network and you want to use something like a long short term memory network, right? So typically what happens is people, you know, if you look at Google or all the articles that are kind of written, they're kind of contrived in some sense that you they just say, hey, you take your signal and then you create your own LSTM architectures and that should work, right? Well, turns out, that the thought process kind of works in theory, but not on in reality, right? So now I'm going to show you um, not just one way. I'm going to show you a way how you can create your uh, classifier that can not only differentiate between three segments, but you should also be able to interpret these features, right? So in order to do that, I'm going to be using a technique called scattering, wavelet scattering technique. What that does is it helps you reduce the dimensionality of your signals so that your LSTMs can easily digest those signals and then you know, work very efficiently. So I'm gonna be showing you some examples now. Like for example, this technique works when you know feeding raw data to RNNs or LSTMs does not work. So you can try it, you can take your, if your signal is long enough, which you know typically if you're looking at arrhythmia, for instance, you probably have to collect like 65,000 samples before you can say, um, the person is suffering from arrhythmia because that's exactly what the doctors do, right? You'd really need a good chunk of, you know, signals or, you know, longer duration of signals in order to be able to tell what's going on, right? Um, so that's one approach. The other, appro other reason is it can also work when you have less data to begin with. So sometimes you just have very less data and this technique kind of helps you pretty quickly to build a model um, even if you have less data. Right, and the other part is data augmentation could also be challenging sometimes, right? That's when this could be used. So what are the benefits of this using this scattering networks and signal classification workflows, right? So the main idea is, uh, let me show you this one right here. So for example, on the left, what I'm showing you is I have my signal, I've just traced, I've just collected, or I've just um, taken that signal and uh, created a long short term memory network. And if you notice, the long short term memory network kind of goes through these cycles of, you know, it's almost like it kind of trains and then it loses the information and at some point the loss kind of goes to infinity. So even after 10 minutes, you know, my model has not even converged because obviously, because if you think about it, right, the information, the signal may not be really be explicit in the time domain. And feeding raw data may result in out of memory issues on GPUs as well, and this could lead to long training time. So this is just ECG plus LSTM, right? Now, if I show, if you notice here, I've just, instead of just taking that raw data and throwing it to an LSTM, I just use a small module here, which kind of captures essential information. I'll talk about all those techniques a little more in detail while reducing the dimensionality. And what that does is it helps the LSTM to generalize pretty quickly. So the same data set, now, instead of using raw data, I just use pre-processed data with, uh, with the wavelet scattering technique and LSTM my network converges in 20 seconds, right? And if you look at this, right? 20 seconds versus 10 minutes where it has not even gone anywhere. So that's the main idea. So what is this feature extraction? What is this automated feature extraction and how does it work? So this technique can be best explained in the context of deep networks, right? So when you look at these deep networks, these deep networks are basically some kind of convolution followed by some kind of nonlinear activation and then pooling, right? So the idea is, what people have found is when you take these deep networks and uh, when you start looking at these filters, uh, especially the filters and see what kind of filter shapes these are, it turns out these filters more or less look like wavelet-like filters. So the idea is people said, why don't we just, you know, if we, uh, if it turns out that they're gonna get some wavelet-like filters, why not just use wavelet filters as a starting point by fixing them, right? So that's why there's no learning here. So that's why this kind of works as an automated feature extraction. And in some sense, you have the non-linearity averaging kind of baked into the network. And uh, you're basically calling this whole operation as deep feature extraction, because now people have found that you, you just need three layers instead of these 25 or 28 layers to actually extract all the features. And 
and this is not this is this is based off of paper i'm going to show you so this is a compact network for extracting all the features it works with signals and images both so if you have images and if you want to basically do some texture analysis or classification we have some good examples of how this works on images then this can also relieve some requirements on amount of data model complexity featured in a lot of leaderboards and it's a good framework for automatically extracting and relevant and compact features and this is a paper that's we have based it out of and what we've seen is if you use this as an input to a lot of the deep networks like lstms kind of works very well right so so i'm going to jump jump to the example real quick um in this case right and i'm going to be quickly covering this i think we are kind of we only have like seven minutes so i want to be cognizant of time but i'll just show you the main idea here right so the main idea is i'm using the same data set right um, and i have now i have 113 records in the training data and then 49 records in testing data so this is how my signals kind of look like and to extract these features all i have to do is this so let me just run this so so we have this signals so all i'm doing is i just have to specify the signal length and sampling frequency is optional but i just have to specify signal length and i get a filter bank and i take the filter bank apply it to my signal here this is my signal and i get my features out so just if you want to compare right just to compare this right if i look at my input signal it is 65000 samples my output signal is roughly 500 times 8 which is 4000 samples so imagine getting 95% reduction in size of features now you may ask hey you are reducing it by 95% but how do you know you you actually capturing all the information in the signal well that comes that point comes in when you actually take these features and connect it to interface it with some kind of a deep network like lstm and if your lstm is doing a fantastic job which in my case is doing which means you know i can do you know i can perform my model can perform as is as better as you know any other model with just 95 with only 5% of that data right and the other good thing is now that you have if we, let me just show you this sf it's basically um maybe it's sf yes it's sf so my sf is basically a pretty simple network here it just has two layers or three layers i'm going to talk to you about it real quick and then you can also visualize these layers right so for example with using the scattering transform i can cover the details if you if you want but the idea is this is this is how my signal looks and i'm not using these images i'm just showing i'm just visualizing these 500 by 8 that, that's all right so i'm just showing you this how this features actually look so my first layer has uh, you know the features you know you can almost see the features are kind of you know the, for the given signal in the first layer and the second layer kind of start looking a little different and if you have some i mean i don't know if you've heard of this computer vision thing called scale invariant feature transform the scattering technique is basically based off of that but it's a ex natural extension of that so that's why people have said uh, people have found this to be pretty good right so all i'm doing is now this is just one way of visualizing it you can visualize it for different so this is class 2 and then this is a class one sample notice how they are already different here they look very different right just the uh, level two just the uh, second filter bank notice the arrhythmia starts looking different from the normal signal right so the idea is you take these feature vectors right this 500 by four 500 by eight for all across all the signals right i'm just adding one other column which is the label of the signal and then I train an LSTM on all these scattering features, right? If I just train an LSTM pretty simply, right? So let me just run this if you, if you want, right? So now you'll notice, see, this is how your LSTM kind of learns all the features quickly. And if you, even if you look at your LSTM, it's pretty simple. I mean, I'm not even kind of creating a deep LSTM network where God knows what happens inside that network. It's just a simple layer. If you look at the architecture, it's a, there is one input layer. There's an LSTM network uh, layer, which is basically I'm converting it to output mode last because I wanted to classify. Fully connected layer, softmax layer, classification layer. How simple can it get, right? Or how complicated can it get with this kind of a deep network? And if you notice, you know, if you use simplistic techniques, you know, your model kind of converges pretty quickly, just in five seconds, beautiful, right? And then when I um evaluate it on my test data set i'm getting 96 percent accuracy 
here, right? So there are techniques to actually take. I mean, in your case, let's say when you apply it on your signals, if it doesn't work, you can always improve the classification accuracy. There are some optional parameters that I didn't want to, I'll not go into that, but that's one area where you can probably look into it a little more closely and see, you know, how that works. Now, just as comparison, right? If you want to, I mean, we've just looked at uh, EC, the CNN approach and the, and this uh, scattering LSTM approach. Now, just notice, you know, if you look at the number of layers, we have 25 layers in the CNNs or roughly 27 layers if you remove the input layers and the scattering and LSTM has just five layers, right? Just pretty much this, those five layers are there. And the inference time here is 1.1 second for the same signal sample, which is 65,000 samples long. Here, I'm able to do the same job in 0.4 seconds, which means, you know, if you're looking at more like a, you know, an edge deployment kind of, a, you know, use case, then maybe this could be your best friend, right? This column here, right? And if you look at the network size itself, it's just one megabyte versus 200 MB, because obviously I just am using only five layers in my uh, LSTM network, right? So that's why it's just one MB, one megabyte versus 200 megabytes here and so on and so forth, right? So this kind of, you know, now that you have these ideas of, you know, what can what you can do, then you can take these deep networks and, you know, the good thing in MATLAB is through automated code generation, you can target these different frameworks like ARM, Cortex-M, NVIDIA or Intel um, areas, or you can also look at integrating your analytics with different systems. Like for example, uh, we've, sh I mean, you can take the same pipeline, generate C, C++ code within MATLAB, or you can generate HDL code. So this is one area where we're uh, looking at if you want to generate HDL code for deep networks, I think we can, you should certainly reach out to systematics and we can start talking about this because this is one area where we can actually help you out um, very liberally, right? Because we have some new capabilities that are coming in. Or you can now generate a standalone application, a Java application, or integrate it into some kind of a production environment, right? So just to recap, what we've done is this particular technique, I mean, I've just taken um, the second example here that I showed you and the signal processing pipeline and the deep network pipeline, I'm using GPU code generation for deployment. So I'm now gonna show you, walk you through that process real quick, right? So all you have to do is, you know, you start to generate this optimized code for target environment. You first pick up your uh, hardware. For instance, you choose a board, you provide the target info, whatever board you're using, depending on the Jetson platform or the drive platform, right? And all I'm doing here is if you notice, I'm taking the CWT of my signal. So this is my video. Let me just quickly play this. Okay, there's some kind of a problem here. It doesn't want to play a video. Maybe it's because of, uh, not sure why it doesn't want to play a video, but all I wanted to show you is this process where it kind of, takes in maybe i can just show it here probably i'm having it doesn't want to play a video over zoom call maybe so let me just see if i can play this video yep this one it's it's working within the PowerPoint, it didn't work, right? So I have my CWT time frequency representation, and then I take my model, which is going to take a time frequency representation and predict what kind of image or signal I have, right? So this is just my starter function. And basically this is where the heart of my operations are, right? And all I'm doing here is basically pretty simple. I'm just taking in a signal, just as an example, and I'm basically running through the GPU coder pipeline. So now I open up the GPU coder, I provide a function name, whatever the starting point of the function is, and then boom, I quickly run through this process. I just specify the input files here. So this is for another example where I'm using it on a signal length of 124 samples, but I just wanna show you the interface and you know how, you know, what the process looks like. So you can now start generating code. So for example, you can say I want a generic, you want an executable and targeting the NVIDIA Jetson platform. So this will generate all the code and you'll see you have pretty much, let me show you this, right? I generate the code here. I have all my CUDA files here on the left. I don't know if you can see it, it's pretty small, .cu files. I have all the header files, everything, you know, kind of generated automatically through or for my signal processing and the deep network pipeline, right? So imagine doing this for your application. And once you're done with this, then 
you know you kind of have a nice iot enabled application that you can use um, you know through these workflows right so with that we are coming to an end to this webinar i hope this was interesting to you so what we can do is now if you have any questions please send them send them through the chat panel and we can um, you know, I can certainly read out your question and try and answer your question. So if you like this webinar, I suggest, I mean, we have a new biomedical AI hands-on workshop available. So this is available in two modules, the biomedical signals module and then the medical imaging module, right? So we will introduce you to different tools and techniques that are available, not just for model development, but also for the entire AI artificial intelligence pipeline development, right? So if you're interested, please contact your representative at Systematics. Uh, we can uh, conduct this free workshops for you. This can be delivered virtually and we'll use MATLAB online where all you have to do is just bring in a laptop with internet connection and that's pretty much it. We will, the instructor will walk you through the different steps and we can certainly cover these two workshops uh, uh, in depth for you all so that you can, you know, get a good understanding of how to annotate your data, how to use these different techniques like machine learning and deep learning to build predictive models. We'll also have a section on how you can optimize these networks uh, using Bayesian optimization. We'll give you a quick crash course of that, followed by the code generation. So we'll go through the GPU code generation module and uh, kind of go from there, right? So these two modules are available depending on what kind of signals you frequently work with please do contact your representative at Systematics. And with that, um, that brings me to an end to my webinar.